Well, good morning, friends and ADHD. Russ Barkley, back again with your weekly Saturday research review. Uh, but before we do, as always, a short dad joke for you. Here's your dad joke for today. When you're cold, you should always go stand in a corner. Want to know why? Because it's always 90 degrees there. Don't you just love the wordplay in these jokes? Probably not, but okay, let's get started. We've got five research papers to take a quick look at today, three of which involve sex. So it's going to be a really interesting Saturday morning here on research and ADHD. First up, though, is a paper that comes out of France that is a review using a very large birth cohort of individuals with ADHD. These are children. Uh, and these individuals have been followed over time at age three, seen again at age five. And what they're looking at is the relationship between low socioeconomic status, asthma, and later risk for ADHD. And what they found in this paper, which by the way was published over in NPJ's Mental Health Research Journal, what they found was that if at age three, a child was in a family of lower socioeconomic status, there was a higher likelihood that the child would have ADHD by age five. They also found that if the child had asthma earlier in their preschool years at age three, that also increased the risk of having ADHD at age five. They go on to argue that the relationship between socioeconomic status and asthma might be one that is contributing to the future risk to ADHD. In other words, they're inferring or sort of possible causal relationship here, even though they admit later in the paper that their results are purely correlational. Once again, we see this rush to interpret causation when what we have is correlational data that could be explained by other possible hypotheses. For instance, they did not measure whether or not the child had ADHD at age three. Well, you need to do that because you would have to control for that risk in order to look at risk for ADHD at age five. So they didn't do that. It's very possible that the kids were ADHD at age three, and that predicted having ADHD at age five, and the relationship with socioeconomic status and with asthma is not a causal one, but just a correlation of the fact that more kids with ADHD are known to develop asthma. We know that. And more kids with ADHD are likely to come from somewhat lower socioeconomic status. Uh, and that's been shown as well. So no causation there at all. These three things simply go together. Another possible explanation is they didn't measure ADHD in the parents at all. And we know that ADHD in a parent overall might reduce, probably does reduce to some extent, their income and their employment status. So parental ADHD could be explaining the low socioeconomic status of the family in this research project. So although the results are sort of interesting and they kind of replicate what we know about the relationship of ADHD to asthma and to socioeconomic status, in no way does this study show some kind of causal connection among them. Could just as easily be explained by parental genetics in which the parents have ADHD as well. Okay, next up, I promised you, are some articles about sexual factors in ADHD. This is one that I had never seen before. And while I usually don't cover papers that were presented at conferences and then wind up having their abstract put in a journal, this one was unusual enough that I thought we'd at least talk about it for a moment. This was the abstract of a presentation that wound up being published in the Journal of Urology. This one comes out of Seattle, Washington, and it's a study of pelvic floor pain syndromes in men with and without ADHD. So 
I've never seen anybody study that before, never even thought to ask about it, but here we go. Uh, this study questioned men with and without ADHD, whether they had pelvic floor pain syndrome uh, and whether they had any voiding dysfunction, that is voiding during urination, uh, and then looked at the relationship of that to ADHD. And what did they find? They found that in this very large sample of 106,000 men in the ADHD cohort compared to 212,000 or more controls, so very large samples here, they found that there was a significant increase in pelvic floor pain as reported by the men with ADHD. So, wow, never heard that before. But before we run off here we, again uh, and interpret this as some kind of great relationship or, or large association, let's take a look at the actual data. They found that about 4.75% of the cases of men with ADHD had pelvic floor pain compared to, get this, 3.9% of the control group. In other words, there was about an eight tenths, all right, eight tenths of a percent increase in the occurrence of pelvic floor pain in the men with ADHD. Talk about making a mountain out of clearly a little molehill. Uh, this is a paper that illustrates that when you have very, very large samples, you can get statistical significance, even if the underlying absolute data shows just a very small difference in reality. The difference here being eight tenths of a percent increase in risk. The study also reported that those men who had been taking non-stimulant medication for their ADHD reported somewhat more such pain than did those not taking a non-stimulant, but also having ADHD, so a slight increase there as well. So it's kind, kind of an interesting finding, needs to be replicated, but no way should we be running around claiming that a majority of people, men in this case with ADHD, are likely to have this. It's really a very small percent, well below 5% of the men reporting such pelvic floor pain. But I'd never heard of this before, so I thought, I'd share it with you. So let's go on and take a look at another study. This one published over in the Journal of Sexual Medicine. Uh, this is a study that comes out of the Dominican Republic, believe it or not. So this is a study that compares a sample of Dominican women who had ADHD, or excuse me, who had a female orgasmic disorder. Let's get the relationship here correctly. So they looked at 221 Dominican women. They sorted them into 107 women who had reported female orgasmic disorder, and they compared them to 114 women who had no sexual dysfunction. Okay, so that's the comparison. What were they looking for? What was the relationship between orgasmic dysfunction and ADHD and depression? And what they found is that they highest risk of orgasmic dysfunction in these women was in those with ADHD. Women with ADHD were almost five times more likely to report some kind of orgasmic disorder or dysfunction than were women without ADHD. So uh, again, we've seen hints of that kind of finding in earlier studies on sexual behavior, risk-taking, and any sexual dysfunction symptoms in people with ADHD. This study simply replicates that earlier finding and points out that ADHD seems to be a relatively high risk factor for that kind of dysfunction. By the way, they also found that severe depression increased the risk of sexual dysfunction, of orgasmic dysfunction, excuse me, about two and a half times more than those who were not depressed. So uh, again, interesting paper, nice to see some replication going on down there in South America, also uh, replicates earlier research on sexual dysfunction associated with ADHD, in this case showing that there is a 
rather robust relationship between women with ADHD and having some kind of orgasmic sexual dysfunction. Okay, we're going to move on to yet another paper this week on sex. What is it this week? What's going on? Something in the water? I don't know. But what we found in this journal, which is the International Journal of Impotence Research, is that adults with ADHD in this study were examined for whether or not they had a higher instance of paraphilic fantasies and behaviors compared to people without ADHD. Now, very quickly, what is a paraphilic fantasy or urge? So we can see here that the National Institute of Health defines paraphilias as persistent and recurrent sexual interests, urges, fantasies, or behaviors of marked intensity that involve objects, activities, or even situations that are atypical in nature. That's a rather generic definition, doesn't really help sort it out too much. But if we go down a little further and look at study.com, they go further and say paraphilic erotic behaviors involve intense and persistent interests in binding, cutting, spanking, strangulation, or whipping another person. It also might include sexual interests in children, corpses, non-human animals such as horses and dogs, and inanimate objects. So uh, again, we can take this as paraphilias are just these recurrent sexual interests or fantasies in having sex with objects or uh, it situations of an atypical nature. Okay, so let's go back and take a look at the paper. This paper is comparing 75, excuse me, 160 adults with ADHD to 75 adults without ADHD. And they are looking at the instance of paraphilic behaviors. And what they find is that both groups reported high rates of these paraphilic fantasies and behaviors. 40% of the control group reported such interests, and the relationship with ADHD was 58%. So about an 18% increase over the population occurrence of this kind of fantasies and behaviors linked to ADHD. So we would say there's some increase in these behaviors, but even in the control group, there was a relatively high rate and a substantial minority of these adults in having these kinds of sexually arousing interests, fantasies, urges, or behaviors. Uh, they also went on to say that within individuals with ADHD, they found that both very sexually arousing paraphilic interests during masturbation fantasies and in sexual behaviors were correlated with the risk for hypersexuality, but only in the ADHD group. So uh, again, a rather interesting study because I hadn't seen any earlier studies that focused on this particular sexual interest, urge, or fantasy. But this one suggests it might occur somewhat more often in adults with ADHD than in control adults. But both groups show a relatively high incidence of this kind of interest, urge, or fantasy. So there you go. That's another paper. We're going to wrap it up with a non-sexual paper just to kind of cool you down here a little bit. Uh, and this one is um, in the journal Frontiers in Neurology, and it's an exploration on the use of transcranial pulse stimulation in helping to improve ADHD symptoms in adolescents. It's just a pilot study. It only involved 30 participants. Half of them got the transcranial stimulation. That's putting a transmitter on the scalp and then sending an electric signal into the brain, this sort of pulsing. Sometimes it uses a magnetic stimulation. Sometimes it's electrical, but in this case, 15 adolescents got it, 15 got a sham form of the pulse stimulation. They found that there was a 30% improvement 
in ADHD symptoms in the actively treated group compared to the sham placebo group, and that this 30% difference seemed to last for up to one to three months during the follow-up. So suggest that this might be a possible treatment for adolescent ADHD in the future. The improvement, although 30% sounds impressive, it's not. We see much more marked improvement with ADHD medications. But the fact that it's a reasonably well-controlled study using a sham placebo treatment, that's very important, and taking objective measures of ADHD as well, and doing follow-ups after treatment. All of those suggest that the study's pretty rigorous, despite the fact that it used a very small sample. So this basically suggests it's a pilot study. It's worth doing a larger study to see whether or not the results can be replicated. So, well, there you have it for this week. Five studies that we reviewed for you. All the rest are over in the description that goes along with this video if you're interested in those. Uh, and as always, uh, if you know of people interested in this channel, please recommend the channel to them. And if you're not a subscriber, I invite you to subscribe to the channel so I can alert you to any new videos that I'll be posting, including these weekly Saturday research roundups. All right, everybody, thanks for joining me this weekend. I'll see you later in the week with another commentary and research review. Be well, everybody.